This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of switching your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling. Harness the best converting checkout and same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Stop leaving sales on the table. Discover why millions trust Shopify to build, grow, and run their business. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech23. This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute, and available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Ben Lytle about futurists versus potentialists. Ben Lytle, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you, John. Happy to be here. Yeah, it is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from the Phoenix area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about futurists versus potentialists. I was really intrigued by this when we were first setting up this this interview and I was looking over some of the materials you sent me. You know, I, I know you you see yourself as a bit of a futurist. I've thought of myself a bit that way as well. But I like this framing around potentialists. I'm really excited to unpack that with you. As we get started, I wanted to share Ben's bio with everybody. Ben Lytle is a self-made serial entrepreneur or CEO known for being ahead of the curve, creating something out of nothing, adjusting and thriving during change. He now is a thought leader on the future. He launched five successful companies, two listings on the New York Stock Exchange, his best known success being Anthem with a current market value of more than 100 billion. He is a healthcare policy expert who served on state and presidential healthcare commissions and a governance leader with extensive public company experience. And I could share way more than that, Ben, but I'm <laughs> going to pause there. Anything you would like to share with the audience by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Uh, no, I think uh, that uh, I've, I've met, I'm very I'm b- very much a, a family man. I have a I have a large family, uh, eight, three adult children, eight grandchildren. I'm very close to them, uh, and I've traveled the world a bit of a lifelong student, uh, and uh, and and I'm excited to talk about what I think can be a, a fabulous future. Uh, but the more we the more we prepare ourselves to do it, to the, the better it'll be. All right. Well, let's start with the whole notion of futurists. There's a lot of people who are self-proclaimed futurists. Um, You know, I, again, I kind of see myself at least in part, you know, as, as a bit of a futurist. Um, What, how, how would you define that? What, what does that mean to you? Um, And then we can contrast that with this idea of potentialists. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the the uh, the uh, the when I think of futurists, I'll just mention two or three names: two contemporary and and one who's uh, was uh, was one of the real early fabulous futurists, I believe. Uh, just to give a context, so in today's uh, uh, in today's uh, life, I would say Ray Kurzweil, who is a, both a scientist, a writer, uh, and an incredible uh, thinker. 
Uh, and and he goes so far as to often pick t- dates and times, and not many people will do that because it's mm-hmm. so hard to do. But I think Kurzweil, somebody I pay a lot of attention to. Another guy is Peter Diamandis. He's a he's a he's definitely got a big audience, and he pays a lot of attention to it to the future and tries to predict it uh, and give a lot of advice around it. The 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 father of all those in my lifetime uh, was uh, was uh, 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 was was the guy who wrote uh, the guy who wrote Future Shock uh, and uh, and in and uh, and and he had a lot of influence on me. He wrote three seminal books around the future. So, but but in thinking about what is a, a futurist, I think their concentration is trying to tell you what it's going to look like, what it's going to be, what what are you not paying attention to that you should. And that's a very healthy thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so early in my, in my career, uh, because I was in the early days of computer technology, uh, it wasn't like you could pick up a newspaper and read about what was going to happen in technology. It just wasn't front page news in those days. And so I learned to follow people um, uh, that uh, that I thought uh, could be uh, could be could contribute to my knowledge and to also predict uh, where we were going. So that's that's what the way I looked at a futurist. Potentialist is really a little bit different, and and the premise uh, for me, at least, uh, and and why I call myself a potentialist and have for a long time, is that. Uh, the the every the everything that we're doing if you look at the arc of history it's take it's lifting us towards a higher potential we're tapping into more as a as a as a race uh and as individuals we're tapping in to our our innate potential more um the uh, the uh, the the IQ at least according to one expert has increased 60 points in 120 years that's pretty. That's amazing because we don't think about 120 years ago people being having low, on average, lower IQs, but they did, and almost all that growth has come in abstract thinking. And it wasn't like some government man's mandate said, "Okay, we're going to increase IQ." It's just happened, and 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 there's a a, no, a number of other measures I could talk about. We're more civilized. 120 years ago, we used to take kids to public executions in this country, if you can imagine. That, that we, we wouldn't, we, first of all, we don't have ex- public executions anymore, but also we sure as heck would never think about taking kids. That's how far we've come. And we forget that sometimes. So my what I'm what I believe is that we are evolving to a higher level of tapping into more of our potential. And that's coming for a lot of reasons. Uh, uh, technology, we're going to integrate more tightly with automation, which is going to unleash a lot of potential we can't do today. Uh, we, don't, we, we don't have or don't know how to use. Uh, it's going to come because of the population decline, and each of us is going to become more important. Uh, and the work we do is going to become more important and how we spend our lives. So... Uh, and for me, I really uh, this it, that this this came in a moment when I was 20 years old, and uh, and this says the power of education. Uh, a charismatic young professor said to me in our class of about 18, "You don't have to be anything what in anything anybody else wants you to be. Mm-hmm. What you can be, what you can be, is already inside you to be discovered." Uh, and through outside experiences to, to be discovered. And you can, and you discovering and living your potential is the only real measure of success. And that, and I've then tested that theory with so many people who were considered famous and, and massively successful that I had the opportunity to know. And pretty much that's what every one of them said, <laughs> you know, yeah. you, I would ask them, do you feel successful? And they would say, yeah, I've, I've done my best, essentially. They would say, paraphrased, I've done my best to be my best and left the world a little better and I found it. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And and collectively then, if we're all doing just a little bit better, collectively, that's how we advance 
community, society, the human race right. as a whole, right. right? And and make the world a better place. Yeah. Um, I, I love that. And and really, you know, this idea of futurist versus potentialist, it's not even an either or, right? It's it, no. these are kind it's of two both. separate things, right? Yeah. Right. Um and and I love as you were describing futurists, it's absolutely essential that we pay attention to trends and try to map out what things could look like uh, right. moving forward. That doesn't right. mean we have a crystal ball. I, I can't, you know, perfectly predict anything. But right. when you look over the arc of history and you look over recent trends and, and recent decades, you can see patterns and you can scenario plan. And, you and you know, we don't know when the big next disruption will happen, but we know a disruption will happen. And so you Absolutely. can start to scenario plan and you can start to, um, you know, kind of look around the corner a little bit to see what might be coming. Now, again, nobody, you know, can actually know what's going to happen, but we can have a fairly good sense of the potential possibilities of what can happen. So that's, that's a really important thing. So in business and organizations, we talk about strategic planning, um, strategic planning, kind of the old school mentality around strategic planning, I think is a little passe. And now we need much more of a an ongoing live strategic plan, something that allows us to be more agile, that allows us to look into the future a little bit more clearly. Uh, and it's been fun to see organizations make, make um, that adjustment over time, or at least a lot of organizations. I also really like how you described potentialist. Um, I, I, I think that's, that's certainly what I see my work as, you know, I, I, I want to help develop the potential of people around me, myself and my family and, and people around me. And we all have so much potential. Uh, and and that's lim- it, it gets limited for a variety of reasons. Sometimes there's external constraints put upon us. Sometimes it's sure. limiting beliefs that stick around in our heads from what society has told us or we've told ourselves. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people kind of sell themselves short and why, why people don't fulfill their potential. But if we can while looking into the future, you know, trying to understand, for example, technology and how it's going to reshape the world of work that can give us some clues about how we need to help potent, how we need to help develop the potential of those people on our teams so that we're ready as an organization to, to meet the needs and demands of the future, but also individuals within our teams will be able to have the skill sets, the the mentalities that will help them to be successful, even amidst disruption, amidst, you know, all of the turmoil and the upheaval and the, the messiness of the world that we're in. Yeah. And, and you're, you've got a, a, a lot of audiences looking for practical application here. So, so I'm going to share with them at least uh, my perspective so, so, and it, and it came, so, so I have this, this, this moment when I'm 20, uh, and I actually changed my major, uh, and, and took up, uh, potential and what it is and how do you develop it as an avocation throughout my life. But, uh, and, 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 inter- and interviewed every famous, or not success, famous, some of them were famous, but every successful person I could find, um, what made them that way? And, and that's so I started to build a body of work around this. But for everybody else, here's how it affected my work. I, I literally start, and, and by the way, I, I may have been somewhat born with this kind of outlook. And certainly my parents were very optimistic kind of folks and, and very supportive of uh, you can do whatever you want to do. And, uh, but, but I started to look at my job as a manager was to was to discover help the uh, the people I work with discover and and li- and bring to the surface and live out their own potential and let me tell you yeah. if you focus that way and that's that's your one hundred percent focus or at least your starting point your people will sense it and they'll become loyal as all heck to you because they know you're trying to help them even when you have tough discussions with them about something in their performance, it's not about criticizing, it's trying to help you discover this is in your way. Second place was as an entrepreneur. I built my first company at 27. It, that wasn't even in the added in the five and I'm working on my seventh now. <laughs> so, 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 so I'll always be, uh, I'll always be doing that kind of thing. But what I, what I did with companies, I looked at an idea or I looked at a company and I said, what could it be? 
that became my number one focus, not I got to fix this. And I got, that became the reason you fixed this, perhaps. But yeah. I started looking and sometimes those that resulted in audacious plans and proposal. When I, I will tell you, nobody when I first started thought that I, we could build two public companies in 10 years, two New York Stock Exchange companies in 10, 10 years in two industries like we did with the, my management team and I. And, and and we built Anthem, which became huge. We became Accordia, which became one of the, the uh, seventh largest broker in the world. And we did that in parallel, the, the same team. And this was a team that never built a public company, knew, knew nothing about brokerage. <laughs> and and so so that's the thing as a man, as a leader and a manager, you can make a huge difference. The other is uh, is 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 pragmatic optimism. Uh, nobody wants to hear fairy tales, but if mm -hmm. you've got pragmatic optimism to me is my arguments better than yours. It's like a, a being a good lawyer. Okay. My argument is better than yours. So, so when I talk to people and I'm sure this is again, another thing that your, your leadership, your people in leadership out there, or even if they're just leaders of their families, when yeah. you see people start to go into negative spirals, as we all observe these days, stop them and go, wait a minute, let me ask you something. Do you believe that the, that the human race is being evolved for extinction or abundance? It's one of those unavoidable life questions. You, everybody needs to answer that. And let's, let's say, no, I think we're, we're going extinct. Well, a lot of people have thought that since the beginning of time. I'm pretty well convinced about the fifth person on the world said, oh, it's all over, guys. And they've been saying that ever since. They've been wrong always. Why, where's your argument? My arguments are arc, arc of history. Times look tough. We go through tough times. We come out, and we're always at a higher level. It's the way it's always worked. Could it go wrong? Yeah, but why now? Why now? And so that's 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 the kind of thing that as a as a member of society right now, we're bombarded with negativity from politicians, from the news. This is and even acad and you're an academic, even a lot of academia, very negative. And, and that's that doesn't help anybody. And it particularly it's just wrong. The other thing is, it's just wrong. I, I will. I would like to one time before <laughs> before I leave this earth wake up turn on a newscast and someone say you know what four million and four that four million five hundred thousand and thirty two people in phoenix or any pick your city woke up this had a really good day yesterday or 262 it wasn't so good now think about how different that is but that's the reality of the world we live in not the other so i think as a leader, if you can help bring that potential out of people, if you can see the potential in a business plan or an opportunity or a company, and then if you can speak with pragmatic optimism, be a be someone who shines that light into your world, your family, gatherings, your work, it's going to make a difference. And, and it's, it is really, really needed right now. Yeah. I mean, what, you, you mentioned politics, to the media, you know, we're in the U.S. at least, but I think it's this way in many parts of the world that we're very, very divided. Um, right. It's very polarized. Right. There's a lot of social upheaval. Um, and then you have other parts of the world. You have the conflict in the Ukraine. You have the conflict in the Middle East right, right now. Um, I mean, there are definitely challenges. Oh, and nobody, yeah. nobody's suggesting that we put our heads in the sand and just pretend oh. like everything's roses and peaches you know but it, it's it's recognizing the real challenges but also understanding how they fit contextually into the broader arc of history as you've mentioned right. so you know i have all i have all sorts of concerns about the world i have all sorts sure. of concerns about um, a variety of things um but i also then get to choose you know what am i going to focus on am i going to focus yeah. on being overwhelmed by the things that are are not the way I, you know, the, I wish they were different or am I going to pragmatically, you know, try to 
put a plan in place and move forward to make a difference and to try to improve the things that I, I feel are not where I want them to be, whether that's well, in my personal so life, right. at work, at home, or whatever the case may be. And, and just having that, you know, again, not, not a head in the sand, um, Pollyanna-ish kind of unrealistic optimism, but just like an optimism founded in history, like founded in the fact that collectively we are better off today than we were a generation ago. Oh, um, cer- absolutely. C- certainly a hundred years ago, 200 years ago. And so are there things I'm worried about, concerned about? Absolutely. Um, if, if we zoom in on just the workplace, are there things in organizations that are toxic? Are there leaders that are toxic? Are there unhealthy organizations? Are there organizations that exploit their people and exploit the environment and, and their consumers? Sure there are, but collectively, like, I think we're way, like, I'm, I'm glad I lived today and not 50 years ago. <laughs> I'm glad I work in the organizations of today and not the organizations of 50 plus years ago, because collectively it's just way better. Um, for, yeah, for people. You're right. And, and Jonathan, you, you you bring a point that's critical. And I'm going to make a link here between the, the potentialist mindset and developing your working towards your potential and something that is absolutely crucial. And I think will become the focus of education, will become the focus of the way we look at people in the future. And that's wisdom. So, so, so if you look at the, at one of the things that defines when wisdom uh, is the ability to look, to keep things into perspective, to take a broader perspective rather than something narrow. And exactly as you said, we have gone through periods of division and coming back together throughout history. And each, each time one, that, that division, that polarization led to something better. Take an example. In, 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 the, in, the, in the 17th century uh, religious wars, people in Europe were suddenly friends, neighbors who had spent their entire lives around each other, were, were attacking each other and physically. And, and there was a lot of bloodshed. And, and, and it got into politics and in uh, and, and battles between kings. It was a horrible period of time. But it led to the uh, the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment rejecting being controlled by that that, that by d- that defining our lives. Uh, and 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 if you look at it, uh, if you went back to uh, the the uh, the bubonic plague, shortage of people for the first time in history, but people's lives improved as a result the, the workers the people there everyday people had greater demands they wouldn't they refused to be serfs anymore and it led to the to the renaissance it was a contributor to the renaissance so that's these are archetypes of of of, of the his of history that have occurred over and over and over again so a wise person interjects that and says yeah we're polarized but it's taking us someplace and it may get worse before it gets better, but ultimately it, it, it is how something gets birthed in civilizations. And, and so, and it's going on throughout the world. So it pretty well tells us this is not an, a U.S. issue or an EU, EU issue or a China, China issue. This is, this is the world going through a period of time. And there's an answer for that. Now, we don't have time to talk about it today, but it's, it's, it's late in Dr. Uh, uh, in Dr. Alvin Toffler, who wrote Future Shock and two other great books, he said, when we accelerate change faster than people can comprehend it, more importantly, faster than institutions can adapt, we're going to have this kind of disruption. And, and he predicted, he called that 50 years ago, and it's absolutely right. But for, all, for, for each of us, what, here's what we can do. We can work towards our potential. And what is our potential? Our potential is the ability to look beyond our instincts and our emotions and our fears and our biases, particularly in the moment of decisions, because they will make a, they will cause you to make unwise decisions and work towards where we, so that's something we can each do when we're confronted with an issue, we can pause think a little broader, don't respond immediately, 
and and then try to give a response that 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 speaks to people of wisdom and that something is going to be better yeah very well said and if we apply this now i mean we've been talking in in general terms about right. societies as a whole right. which i think is an important perspective we've talked a little bit about how this applies into organizations and the teams but let's right. let's zoom in and focus in on okay. that for just a few minutes sure. you know if if i'm taking if i'm a leader you know I could be middle management all the way on up to executive level. It doesn't really matter. We choose a unit and and I'm a leader and I have people that report to me. I have a team of people. I like how you described earlier that, you know, you saw your role as a leader, like your number one job was to develop the people around you and to help them fulfill their potential. I agree with that. I think that's the number one thing leaders should be doing. Um, It's not the number one thing that most leaders are doing. Uh, You know, most leaders get caught up in the just day-to-day grind they're putting out fires they're maybe their ego is in the way like there's a whole bunch of reasons why leaders don't focus on the developing the potential of the people around them um but i agree like that that should be our number one thing if 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 we agree that that is what the greatest leaders do they develop the bench strength they develop the potential of those around them and it's a rising tide lifts all ships kind of scenario where you know i invest a lot as a leader into you Sometimes you're going to leave, you're going to leave my team, you're going to leave the organization and go somewhere else. So I could feel like, oh, that was a waste of time and energy. Or I can just recognize that that's part of the process. Like sometimes people stay, sometimes people go because there's better opportunities elsewhere. But I recognize the the necessity of investing into and pouring into my people so that they feel valued so that they feel like they have an opportunity to grow and develop and develop into their potential. And more often than not, when you develop people that way, they're going to be happier. They're going to be more engaged. They're going to be more productive, more innovative, and you will have some people leave, but you'll have more people who are loyal to you and committed and are going to really put their whole heart into the work that they do. Well, and here, here's the thing, a, 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 an easy walking around way to think about it. Think about the great leaders throughout history. I happen to be a Churchill fan, uh, you know, uh, but, uh, but you, could, you could add in battle George Patton. Uh, you could add uh, uh, George Washington, uh, John Kennedy. They called us to our better selves. Always. Now, think about that as not only a leadership tool and not in big terms, but but in very precise terms. One of the things I learned to say to my subordinates, uh, uh, even at the at high at high executive levels, when you know when I was running forty or fifty thousand folks, my executives they bring me something and I'd go, "Do you do you think this is your best work?" It's a very interesting question. <laughs> when my kids would come to me with, you know, whether it was their grades or something, I'd go, is this your, is this your best work? And, and that wasn't meant to sound, I want, what do you think? And almost invariably they're going, well, maybe not my best. Well, how would you improve it? What would you do different? I just ask questions. Yeah. And 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 they always produced something more serious, something better. It was very rare, but sometimes they would say, "No, this is. I believe this is my best work." Uh, and and you can use different terms, but the idea is calling people to be their best, They're, to reach inside and pull their better self to the surface, and that actually has powerful stuff in psychology as well. Uh, you're you're essentially tapping into that inner person inside you that does want to be better and does want to do do better and so so this is it's a really powerful and pragmatic way to lead and coach uh that that i find and so you know my 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 books and my speeches around my book are trying to call us to our better self because it's coming in magnitudes and it's going to get easier because we're going to have the power of automation to help us get there. Yeah. Well said, Ben, this has been a, a really fun conversation. I know at the time I'm going to need to let you go here in a minute, but before right. we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience, how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, where they can find sure. your books, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. 
Okay, great. Uh, well, th this is the, the book that's out there right now is called The Potentialist, Your Life in the New Reality of the Next 30 Years. Um, and I think you'll find it an interesting and useful read. I'm in the process of writing the second book, which I'll re release next year, which is called Potentialist 2, uh, The Pursuit of Wisdom. Uh, and then the third book will come out uh, two years later, probably 2026. And that'll be how do we, fa how do high potential people blow it? How mm. does that, how does that happen? And that's called Predator and Prey. Uh, and so, uh, so that's the three books. Uh, you can find me at, at, uh, at potentialistfuture.com. Uh, that's my website. Uh, I'm also active on LinkedIn uh, and on in the in the in in Facebook uh, and and love to connect with people. I give a lot of speeches, a lot of webinars, uh, and uh, but that's the purpose. I'm trying to do what I can to get us to reach inside our best selves uh, because uh, we're we're going to have a great opportunity to be uh, to lift humanity and ourselves in the next thirty years. Ben, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Ben can do for you. Check out the books. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day, and that you can have all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe, and please join us again soon.